Welcome to Creepy Confidential. I'm your host, Noelle, your resident weirdo Wisconsinite. I open case files on cryptids, cults, conspiracies, and other worldly creepy, bringing you new cases, live broadcasts, and local lore. So get ready, creeps. It's Creepy Confidential. October 20th, 1967. Roger Patterson and Robert Gimlin are shooting B reel footage in Northern California's Six Rivers National Forest next to Bluff Creek. The duo are on horseback riding through the fall forest with some camping gear, food, and a rented 16 millimeter video camera. They are there to attempt to capture real footage of a Bigfoot. During the summer of 1967, there are accounts that Roger had started filming a docudrama about a group of cowboys being led by an old miner and a wise Indian tracker in search of Bigfoot. As they descend into the bluff from the trail, the horses start to balk and buck in alarm. Suddenly emerging from the shadows is a towering dark figure that defies explanation. It is massive, covered in coarse dark hair and its features are undeniably primate-like. It saunters across the dried riverbed, walking in a direct path out into the open sun. They notice the creature appears to have large breasts, displaying to them this large creature must be female. Is this creature the one they are looking for? Their hearts pound as Patterson fumbles for his camera, praying that it will capture the astonishing sight before them. He calls out quietly to his friend Bob to cover him with his rifle while he tries to ready the camera. With adrenaline coursing through their veins, Patterson manages to steady his trembling hands and begins to roll footage on the site before them. The small camera comes to life. The creature, seemingly unafraid of their presence, continues its steady walk through the trees across the dried up sandbar of Bluff Creek. Its musculature shifts beneath its fur and it crosses the clearing. Then it disappears into the forest once again. This little 16 millimeter film camera would capture approximately 59 seconds of footage of this seven foot tall, approximately 350 pound female creature. She would be given the name Patty and would become the holy grail of evidence for Bigfoot trackers over the years. The footage would also be the target of many calling it a hoax. In 1999, a man would come forward claiming he was the man in the suit, and the whole thing was done on a promise of $1,000. Is the Patterson-Gimlin film real? And did these men capture proof of this infamous creature? Or is Patty really just a man in a suit? up creeps today we are breaking down the claims that the famous patterson gimlin bigfoot footage might be a hoax now i know i know do not start throwing bigfoot poop at me okay i'm just bringing you the information so that we can discuss it in my opinion bigfoot is real and i believe this film is known worldwide And ever since it surfaced in 1967, it has been broken down, scrutinized, and held on a pedestal all at the same time as the tippy top of Bigfoot evidence. Now, we're not going to be breaking down the entire film and what we think uh, and discussing in that manner. Today is just for the story of the person who came forward in 1999, claiming he was the man in the Bigfoot suit on that fateful day in the fall of 1967. Now let's start with the list of those involved in this story about our beloved Patty and the person claiming to be the part of the hoax. First, three main witnesses. Roger Patterson, sadly passed away in 1972 of cancer just six years after the film was released. Bob Gimlin, now 91, but over the years stands by his story that he believes what he saw. And lastly, the one that brings us here today, the guy in the suit, Bob Hieronymus, now 82, he claims to be that man in the suit. 
Now, through the story, there's a few other suspects that come up over the years claiming to be a part of this whole thing, but I'll get to them kind of in a minute when we get a little further down here. Now, I'll start with kind of the stars of the show. Bob Hieronymus says he used to ride horses with this group and that he was the one who strode across the Bluff Creek sandbar in Patterson's Bigfoot film. I will say, the footage I've seen of Bob walking around is spot on. The first time I saw a TV program on this hoax and they showed Bob H. Hieronymus, that's what I'll say throughout the rest of it, Bob H. walking across a parking lot, I'll admit, I went, hmm, okay. Holy cow, he walks like Bigfoot. So that was that my, like my first exposure to it was when they showed him walking across the parking lot. Now, there are other gentlemen in Washington's Cascade Mountains, where Bob is from, where they would back up the recent, you know, kind of the claims, the recent claims about Bob, that he was indeed part of this whole thing. He claims in the fall of 1967, Patterson approached him with an offer that he couldn't pass up. They needed a good-sized guy and someone they could trust to wear this big suit. A thousand dollars was offered, and Bob was told it would only take ten minutes to film. Now, Bob, only being 26 at the time, you know he couldn't pass that up. And he jumped on it. So this was the first part of the information that made me scrunch my forehead. So a thousand dollars in 1967. Think about that kind of inflation in your brain. So a thousand dollars is a little over 9,100 bucks in today's money. So that means someone coming up to you and saying, I'll give you $9,100 to play a 10 minute part in a film and all you have to do is wear a suit. That's a lot of money. At the time in 1967, $7,300 was the average annual household income, like total in the year. If Bob is telling the truth, that means someone was potentially willing to give up roughly a month and a half salary to have him play this creature. So apparently they all shook hands, gave an old gentleman's agreement, and met in California just a few weeks after. Bob's story goes that they woke up that morning on the campsite, made coffee, and saddled up the horses. They put the paddy suit on the back of the horses, and about a half a mile from the campsite, they arrived at the location the guys had chosen to film this scene. They unloaded the suit and got Bob all geared up. Now, side note, where this thing was filmed was an area where hunters could have been like out and about waiting for their prey to walk by. So from my reference, growing up in Wisconsin, if you are out deep in the woods during hunting season, you best be wearing some good old hunter orange and know where you are because you risk someone mistaking you for a deer or other game, whatever time of the year it may be. So this just does not seem like a good idea. Um, Not granted, they're in California, but this is like Northern California. So it's just woods in a lot of the places. But back to the story. So they get to the film location and Bob is told to get on his mark so that they can get into position. He claims if they would have paid him the thousand bucks, he would have kept his mouth shut. But why wait 32 years? A thousand bucks in 1999 was barely worth any more in relation and doesn't make sense on why you would come forward now. In 1999, This film was already one of the most famous film sequences in the world, not just in the creepy side of the world, but in the world in general. It showed up everywhere. They mean California, right? A man named Philip Morris and his wife claims to have helped build the suit and then given it to uh, Patterson. So those in the film and costume world might recognize this name of Philip Morris. He's the Philip Morris of Morris Costumes. Same as the one involved in the lawsuit claiming that he created Dr. Evil's costume. So he's like in the biz. So this is the guy. He's the same guy who goes on to, 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 to better things, to bigger things. So he's the one who sent Roger this Bigfoot suit. They all meet up in the creek, back to the creek. They all beat up in, meet up in the creek and set the marks. Bob claims Roger is like shaking the camera on purpose and then settles it to create that shot that we all know where it's really unsteady and then all of a sudden it steadies and they they catch the Bigfoot walking into the bluff. Another part that was added to the story is that Bob has a prosthetic eye and at the time 
He claims to have a few extras kind of hanging around and one was molded into the suit at his suggestion so that he turned and looked at the camera, it was more protruding and that it would glisten in the shot. So now we've gone from, I'll give you a thousand dollars to wear this suit, it takes 10 minutes, to Bob playing costume ideas guy and setting up shots and being Steven Spielberg. I, I just don't know about that. Bob calls this part of the story, quote, his ace in the hole. He claims the lump in his right butt cheek of the suit is his wallet which it's quite protruding in there. I would be really surprised if a 26 year old in 1967 had a wallet that wide because they didn't have credit cards or anything like that. It was just cash or check, you know, that kind of thing. So moving on, he also claims that the, the that football pads were used in the shoulders to create the bulk and that the arms are longer because of the gloves. Like he had extenders in his gloves. So here we go again. So the suit was sent to them by Morris, right? before they knew who was going to play the part. Now, all of a sudden, they not only packed the suit on the horse, but waiters, football pads, glove extensions, and a sewn-in eyeball into the suit all in the field, all made out like the decision just before. I, part of me saw Bob's walk at the start of my research and thought, wow, he must be Patty. And then as we, we went along, I just... Then I heard him tell his story a few times over audio, video, and kind of quoted text within within articles, and these bits and pieces just do not make sense. They don't line up. Costumes that are made for a person, or even like a generic costume suit, right? Like you would go buy a costume suit at a Halloween store or a costume store. They're made to fit a generic person with maybe some street clothes on underneath. So now they added all these things under the suit. I just have, it doesn't make any sense to me. This suit would have not closed in the back or in the neck with all the, that added bulk. Also, with the football pads like added to the shoulders, it would have pulled the crotch of the suit up to make it super tight in the middle and have taken away the illusion of that kind of curvy creature. But I digress. So they get back to camp, right? And Roger hands Bob, this is post filming, Roger hands Bob an envelope uh, with the footage in it. And it's to be taken to Eureka, California to be mailed to Roger's brother-in-law, Al. Bob also claims the timeline with this mailing, claims the timeline that, that he knows and the timeline that was made like public is all off. Bob claims that the footage was mailed on the 20th of October. However, Al showed the film on the 20th, claiming that it had been captured that day. He claims how can it be filmed on the 20th and shot on the 20th and that these things just don't line up in an interview bob tells a story that after a waylon jennings concert he approached al saying hey al when are you gonna pay me that thousand bucks to which al replied that's between you and roger and that was the end of the conversation after he was done filming they show up a few days later to return his horse and they allegedly opened the trunk of bob's car and took the suit back and that was the last he saw of the suit. He never made a dime, and he claims he just wanted people to know the truth. Now, Bob subjected himself to two lie detector tests, one in a small town done by a professional and another on a TV show called Lie Detector, where he was put through all the questions. Both tests, he passed. I want to believe, I really do, but there are a few points on both sides that I wanna leave you with today. To make matters worse, in my opinion, or better, I guess, depending on how you feel about Patty, to start, Bernard Hoovelmans reportedly reviewed the footage and deemed the creature in the film a, quote, suited human. Now, for those who don't know who that is, he is basically the father of the science cryptozoology. He claimed the hair flow pattern to be too uniform, the buttocks being too insufficiently separated, and the demeanor of the creature being too calm during the retreat back to the forest from the men. Now, Dale Sheets and other various special effects texts from Universal Studios stated that it would be difficult to duplicate and that, quote, if it's a man in an ape suit, it's a very good one and that they would, quote, not be able to duplicate that film. Now, also keep in mind this was the 60s, right? Prosthetics at the time were very non-convincing, if existent at all. It was literally like a rubber glove or something. And there was no CGI at all. 
Patty's walking gait and the ease for which she glides across the sandbar also puts a check in the real box for me. Ever walked on a sandy beach? Think about it. You sway and you try not to fall from the sand shifting beneath your feet. A man in a suit would be looking at their feet for two reasons. First, they haven't been there before and shouldn't know the layout. And second, because of the sand and uneven ground, like you have to make sure you know where your feet are going or if they've shuffled underneath you. In Bob's memories, there appears to be a few more noted discrepancies involving what the suit was made out of. In one story, he claims the suit used actual horse hide, while he later claims it used Dynel nylon threads that were stitched to a woven cloth like a backing fur. Now that's awfully sp- specific. You would have to be part of the costume making environment, society, companies, like that sort of thing. And it's just very specific for a dude who was just there to be paid to wear a suit, who is now making in the field changes. Oh yeah, and brought football gear. Oh, and now happens to know what the suit is made out of. So just remember, the suit was was taken just a few days after the filming, you know, or according to him, it just it was hanging out in his trunk and he never saw it again. So did he take the fabric to be analyzed and then sit on it for all these years, you know, with the results? As the wonderful Bailey Sarian would say, that is suspicious. The suit was reportedly made by Morris in his basement after Roger told him he needed an ape suit gag which he then reportedly paid 400 bucks for, 1967 money, which in today's money is a little over 3,300 bucks. So now you put the 400 plus the thousands, 1967 money, he was supposed to pay Bob and then pay for the suit. And that brings the gag up to 1,400 bucks. I highly doubt he paid that much for a gag. Morris would later attempt to recreate the costume. And let's just say he did not stick the landing on that one. I've seen footage of him or like pictures of him standing next to the recreated one it is nothing like the original the color's all wrong the face is all wrong even though it's years later you would think that that would be something that you would try and remember after all this information and evidence i can't prove to you it's not a hoax however there are way too many holes in the stories of the persons mentioned that have come out since bob started speaking his alleged side of the story Do I believe in Bigfoot? Oh, you bet your creepy toes I do. Do I think the Patterson-Gimlin footage was a hoax? Man, I don't want to, but some pieces of both timelines make sense and don't make sense. And the footprint castings. It's just too perfect to be real. The sand-mud mixture would have made them way more squishy and distorted, but you better believe that I have touched a casting of the original footprint, and I was stoked to say the least. To this day, I drive around with a stuffed Bigfoot in my Creepmobile that I found in Port Angeles, Washington, that I named Dean. I named him Dean because he does not have the protruding breasts that Patty does. And I love Supernatural. I love the story of Bigfoot and the Patterson-Gimlin footage, which will always reign supreme in the world of Bigfoot lovers, researchers, and hoax chasers around the globe. I will always look for Bigfoot when I'm in the woods, no matter how thick the brush, no matter how deep in the woods. And Bob may have come out of the woodwork to either gain notoriety or maybe to make a few bucks that he felt he was owed, or maybe just because he needed some cash. Either way, his contribution now to the world of Bigfoot adds to the wonderful world of believers in the creature we have come to know as Patty.